Hey everyone, I'm John and welcome to another episode of Talking Cardboard. Today I'm going to continue going over my top 30 games of 2020. This segment will be on games 20 through 16. And as always, if you like what we're doing here, uh, feel free to leave a comment and subscribe to the channel. Uh, I know we appreciate that and we like interacting with our viewers and kind of hearing your take on the games um, on our top 30 list. So without further ado, let's dive into it. Coming in at game number 20 is another Star Wars game, which I did warn you would be on the list if you can't tell quite often. Um, this game is Star Wars Imperial Assault from Fantasy Flight Games. This game was kind of the precursor to the Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle Earth, which I had talked about previously. And really this is a RPG light kind of in a box. And in Star Wars Imperial Assault, you take on either the role of one of the members of the Rebellion or one person has to take on the role of the Imperial player. In Journeys to Middle-Earth, FFG kind of went away with having um, a player actually play as like the antagonist faction, but I honestly kind of like the fact that in Imperial Assault, someone has to be the Imperial player as I think someone playing the Imperials actually makes them kind of a little more scarier, a little more, um, you know, they're not being controlled by AI and just kind of some default actions. There's actually someone there controlling the Imperial forces, putting some thought into what they're doing, and actually trying to really hinder um, what the Rebellion players are doing. Now, the thing I like with the Rebellion players is, is that game, this game has created probably 20 to 30 characters you can play as. And all the sculptures of the characters are really nice. The models for the Imperials are also really nice. Um, I think they've come up with some really, really good, unique heroes for the Rebellion that people get to choose from. I think all kind of play styles can be, are, are kind of covered with these characters. I mean, you got your support characters, you've got your classic, um, like, running gunners or tanky guys that kind of soak up the damage for the rest of your party. And then you've got, you know, healers and... I guess, you know, a lot of the characters fall into those classes, but they each have their unique, own unique mechanisms, special abilities, little background stories. Um, the cool thing with Imperial Assault is that as you build your campaign deck, you may be choosing from a certain story you want to go through. Like, I think the main core set is just following um, the heroes through, like, some hit-and-run raids on the Empire, um, and the story builds from there, whereas there's a you know, Return to Hoth expansion or Jabba's Realms expansion that covers, you know, some iconic places in the movies. With either of these options, you're still taking, you know, very specific story missions that are related to your characters that have the chance to pop up in your campaign. And, you know, similar to, like, Dungeons & Dragons, you might find yourself off on a side quest all of a sudden exploring the background of your character. And I think that's really cool. And from the few character-specific missions I've played... Um, they've been really fun, and it kind of gives you that chance to, like, dive into the character you're playing a little bit more and tell their tale, and, you know, that's always, what, personally, what I think is a great aspect of the RPG uh, world is um, getting a feel for those tales, you know, really fleshing out your character, becoming them, and playing the game. And, man, Star Wars Imperial Assault really does that, but without, like, the really in-depth, like, full RPG type of play style. This game really, really does a good job picking up with the feel of being that, like, small re uh, rebellion, like, strike team and then trying to take on, you know, this gigantic empire. And you really have to get away from the mindset of most games, like, just, you know, completely demolishing your enemy and instead, like, focusing on, okay, here's our objective. What's the best way to achieve this objective? without, you know, getting sidetracked of just, you know, killing everything in sight. We gotta, you know, really be more cognizant of how you're spending your actions and taking your turns. And I think that's a really cool element of this game where you are not, you just can't, you know, 
sit there and you know shoot every stormtrooper you see you have to think it a little more and weigh your option be more efficient with your um, movements as you know the longer a game typically drags out um certain uh, events might occur that are also going to make your objective a little more harder or you know the imperial player is also getting to spawn more characters as the game goes on so i think it's a really cool in that aspect it's kind of forcing you to think more strategically but yeah that's star wars imperial assault uh probably my favorite you know story based game uh that i've played yet Coming in at number 19 is a game I actually haven't played a ton, but definitely fits my playstyle of having tile placement type mechanics within it, and that is the Isle of Cats. I honestly think I've only played this game like twice, but I had an absolute blast with it. Basically all you're doing in this game is you're drafting tiles with different colored cats on it, and you're trying to place them on the ship. And as you're covering things up, you're either gaining or losing points depending how efficiently you're fitting in these cat tiles. You're going around the table, drafting these uh, cats and other cards um, that allow you to get your cats onto the boat or put treasures on the boat to also fill up some of these spaces. And at the end of the game, you're basically looking at like, what rooms of your ship did you actually have covered at the end of the game? Or how many rat squares are left at the end of the game? and that's a negative points. The cool, unique aspect, I think, to the um, tile placement part of this game is that, you know, it's not just different colored cat tiles that you're drafting between, but each tile is also a different shape. So you're, it's really forcing you to think about the tiles you're drafting as you play. Once you play your first tile, every tile you play out there has to build upon that. Trying to fill in your gaps on this boat becomes increasingly difficult as you start, you know, throwing tiles down. You're trying not to leave your, back yourself into a corner and leave a gap in your ship that none of the tiles that are even in the game can't fit into. And that kind of plays a little bit with the treasures too because I think the treasures are kind of meant to be the stopgap for that because they come in like various shapes as well where they're either like just one treasure is like just one square on the board so you can kind of use that to fill in gaps or you know there's treasures that are two squares in length or three squares or maybe three square squares with a little l on the end it's really a cool mechanic they came up with to draft these tiles that you're then trying to put on the board and i really really like tile placement and kind of just you know that spatial kind of strategizing of how you're going to make things fit has already always really clicked with me and I have a blast playing this game. And there you have it at number 19, you have Isle of Cats, which hopefully I can get to the table a little more this year and uh, we'll see if it moves around the list at all for next year. All right, and coming up at number 18 is a game that's actually somewhat newer to my collection, and that is Everdell. Everdell is, I guess at this core, a worker placement game. And it's kind of taken, you know, the past worker placement game mechanics and it's uh, merged it kind of with like a fantasy woodland creature type of theme. And in this game, basically all you're doing is, you know, your typical Euro style board game things. Like you're getting your workers on the board to collect resources that you're then using to build locations or place iconic citizens into your city. And all you get to work with in this game is a five by three grid in which to build your hovels and place your citizens. And I think one of the cooler mechanics of this game is that, you know, each building has a citizen kind of worker that um, corresponds to it and actually lets you trigger building either the um, specific citizen onto your board for free if you already have the building created because then they're technically occupying that building. And instead of just trying to lure that worker there, now they have a reason to be there uh, and be in part of your um, little city you're building. And I think that's a really cool mechanic to try to uh, work through the deck and combo getting people onto the board for free. Because to be honest, gathering resources in this game is somewhat difficult and pretty slow at the beginning of the game. Trying to get buildings and citizens placed into your city as efficiently as possible is really really important in order to actually get a score at the end of the game that's pretty decent. 
the other cool thing I really like about this game is that in ter typical Euro games, you know, you're just playing by a very structured round limit. And in this game, it's kind of similar where you have four rounds where you're playing through each of the seasons of the year. So you got your spring, summer, fall, and winter uh, seasons. The kind of uh, unique nuance with this game is that a certain season can last different amounts of times for each player. So one player could place out their two workers in the winter season, get their resources, play like one big card on their turn, and that might be it. Whereas another player could be a, a little more efficient with what they're doing, or maybe they're not trying to make a big play that's causing them to kind of soak up all the resources that they created, but you could be playing, you know, smaller buildings and taking more turns um, or comboing, you know, some of those citizens for free into your board like I was talking about earlier, and you're actually kind of stretching on that season while the other player has moved on now to their spring season, for example. So there's really not a lull in the gameplay um, for players that maybe use up their workers more quickly or play cards out of their hand more quickly. It's kind of just streamlined so that you know, people just keep taking turns, you know, in sequential order until they've completed their season. And then once someone has completed their fall season, now they're basically done with the game. They've done everything they can. There's a little interactivity you can still have after you've completed your last season of the game. Again, this is another game that I hope to play more as the year goes on, and we'll see where this uh, ends up. But there you have it, number 18, Everdell. All right, now at number 17 is actually a game that cracked my top 10 last year and it's fallen seven places since then. This is really the game that kind of revitalized my love for miniature games. And, you know, the only reason it's kind of fallen lately is that, you know, I just haven't gotten to play it with COVID and not being able to attend, you know, daily game nights over at FFG or tournaments. I've really missed a lot and it's fallen out of favor with me, but... That game is Star Wars, the X-Wing Miniatures game. This game really, you know, kind of grew my love for getting involved in like a community, getting out to tournaments, getting out to play um, open play nights at Fantasy Flight Games. And man, I've had a whole blast with X-Wing Miniature games. I mean, the X-Wing Miniatures game really captures that feel of, you know, flying spaceships around and dogfighting. Like, you get to take out your little maneuvering templates. You get to pre-plan your movements, what you're trying to, you know, target. All the pilots have really cool, unique special abilities. You know, every ship is unique. They've really thought out the design of these ships and the power of them. So X-Wings are more beefy and have some shields and some hull, but maybe they're not as fast. And you've got TIE Fighters that really do capture that feel of, you know, they have less hull, no shields, but man are they speedy and really maneuverable and you know they're really good at you know getting into position and firing on other ships from behind or kind of getting on their flanks and i've enjoyed this game from the get-go i've attended tournaments for this game um, i play this game with friends introduce it to them i have absolutely loved this game and always will enjoy playing it and hopefully it's a game i actually get to play more again once things kind of settle down and can get back into the local community but yeah x-wing miniatures is very solid i'd always recommend it to someone they've introduced uh unique resources for the different pilots so now a lot of the force sensitive characters actually have a force resource that allows them to take very specialized actions which is really cool made a lot of the older pilots a little better like luke you know his special ability is something with you know, spending force power to turn certain die rolls into, you know, hits or evades, I believe. But yeah, it's really cool where they've come with 2.0. And unfortunately, I just haven't gotten to play the new 2.0 version a lot because I believe it came out, you know, just over a year ago, right before COVID started. And, and since then, I just haven't got a chance to get out and play that with the community yet. And the other thing I like about X-Wing is that at this point now that it's been out, you know four or five years they've pretty much hit on all the, the iconic ships even a lot of the ships from the expanded universe have made it into this game you know you can play as the rebels the empire 
Um, the scum and villainy faction, which is your bounty hunters, other smugglers. They've even got the, the Old Republic and um, the Separatist faction into this game now. So they've hit, you know, that prequel uh, time era. As well as hitting the new sequel area where they have, you know, ships from the First Order. As well as the Resistance. So they've done a really good job at taking all these timelines, getting them into the game making them all viable and strong and have their own feel to them. Um, and I think that's really cool. And it provides players, you know, with something other than just your traditional, you know, Rebels vs. Empire. Really fun game. Like I said, I think it does a very good job at capturing the essence of what dogfighting out in space would be like. And that's really cool to me. All right, and the final game on today's list at number 16 is The Small World of Warcraft. Again, this is another game I haven't played a ton, but it's really made an impact on me for the few times I have played it. I never have played Small World before, but from what I understand, Small World had, you know, maybe some more limitations that world, the Small World of Warcraft kind of removed and added all these different factions into the game. I think they hit on almost every civilization within the game of World of Warcraft that you can choose to be in this game. The basic thought process of this game is that you are trying to grow your civilization and you get points based either on the amount of territories you control and then depending on the civilization and the uh, bonus power associated with them you can get extra points each turn for controlling territories of a certain type or controlling a territory with a relic on it or like unique destinations within the game of World of Warcraft. As you play, you're just trying to, you know, go through the phase of growing your empire, controlling what you can, kind of fighting the other civilizations the other players are throwing onto the board. And then you kind of go through this phase where you finally run out of extra tokens to throw on the board for your current civilization and you kind of change it to this decline phase where now you're no longer really in control of that civilization and you can still earn points from them for owning uh, the territories they're on, but you're not really growing it. You can't play more tokens of that civilization onto the board. You lose its special ability and they're not quite as strong as they are when you initially place them on the board. The point of that is to now you know, draft a new civilization that you then go through the same process of getting onto the board, growing the civilization, and then kind of watching them fall into decline while you proceed to plan ahead for your next civilization. And I kind of think that boom and bust play style is pretty unique to this game and, you know, kind of adds that element of strategy that I haven't seen before. One of the other cool things about this game, as I kind of alluded to earlier, is as you go through the game, you're kind of just flipping up these tiles of each of the factions in the World of Warcraft uh, universe, and you then randomly pair them with a special ability that the faction gets once they're placed onto the board. And I think this is kind of what creates the randomness and the, gives the game some replayability. Each faction has its own inherent special ability, but the premise of having a secondary special ability that can change each game for each faction is kind of cool and it makes it so that no one civilization really sets you on a too focus of a path of what you want to do with them but instead gives you multiple options on how to make the most efficient use of that civilization as you grow it from the beginning and then also kind of leaves you some strategic options for when it goes into de decline. Some of the other special abilities on these characters are really crazy. I think they've done a really good job at looking at the World of Warcraft game and how these factions behaved in the game and then assigning them a special ability that really fits the lore behind that. And I thought that was really cool as an avid World of Warcraft player. Like, that's what really got me into the game, made me interested in the game, and probably is why it's so high on this list. So there you have it. That's games number 20 through 16 from 2020. Really appreciate you all sticking through this and listening to me ramble about some of my favorite games. And yeah, hope you stick around for the next... Uh, set of games coming up number 15 through 11 for everyone at talking Bo cardboard take care and see you next time